Not long ago, on the banks of the Ohio River, there dwelled a sleeping tiger. For the past three seasons, the Cincinnati Bengals lay dormant, waiting for a wake-up call. It took the firm grip of head coach Forrest Gregg to shake the slumbering Bengals. They responded, bared their teeth, and unveiled a startling new look. This bizarre creation became a curiosity around the National Football League. Long known for his brilliant innovations on the field, Bengal founder Paul Brown fashioned this novel design, as new to the game today as the forward pass was a century ago. The look was more than a window dressing. This brash new breed of cat was prepared to defend its lair with a newfound ferocity. <laughs> i tell you the truth, when you wear a helmet like that, it's one of those situations you either got to put up or shut up. In 1981, the laughing stopped. The Bengals were no longer a paper tiger. The Bengals became extremely aggressive. They went after the opposition, and in one season went from second to last in the league in scoring to third best in 1981. The Bengals combined firepower with willpower. Under the legendary influence of Paul Brown and the guidance of Forrest Gregg, the Cincinnati Bengals went from the doormats of their division to the bell ringers of the NFL. And the stripes they wore became the proud symbol of a new era in Bengal football. As the new look Bengals stretched their opening day muscles, they were filled with the optimism that every new season brings. Big plans for the future were underway. But again, it looked like the present got in the way. In the first period against Seattle, quarterback Ken Anderson threw 10 incompletions and was intercepted twice. He was removed from the game with the Bengals behind by three touchdowns. Were these the same old Bengals headed for last place? Not in 1981. Don't ever quit trying. You are a professional. You play 60 minutes of football. Regardless of the score, regardless of the circumstance, never, ever, ever quit. With backup quarterback Jack Thompson injured, third stringer Turk Schonert, number 15, came off the bench to bail out the Bengals. Schonert ran and passed the Bengals to four touchdowns, and Cincinnati came from behind to win 27 to 21. Ken Anderson was reinstated at quarterback, and the Bengals' ability to come from behind to win carried into week two. Down by 11 to the New York Jets, they storm back on a Mike St. Clair touchdown to win by a point. In week four, the Bengals trailed again. High snap, gets it down, the kick is up in the air, and it's good! And the Bengals win it in overtime over the Buffalo Bills, 27 to 24. I think this team really needed discipline. I think it needed direction. And I think that it takes that to become a winner. I think football can be enjoyable, and it is enjoyable to me. Yeah, I'm sure it's enjoyable to these football players. But football is the most enjoyable when you win. And when they did. Beginning in week nine, the Bengals went on a tear, beating five teams in a row by an average margin of 17 points. Against Houston, the Bengals built a 34-7 lead with a defensive charge that forced four Euler turnovers. Cincinnati coasted into first place in the AFC Central. In San Diego, the Bengals' defense grounded Air Coriel and buried the Chargers. 
Cornerback Lewis Breeden scored on the longest interception return in Cincinnati history, 102 yards, and the Bengals beat the highest scoring team in pro football, 40 to 17. After it went over the Rams, the Bengals burned the Broncos behind the all-pro punting of Pat McAnally and the passing of Ken Anderson. With 571 yards of total offense, the Bengals rolled 38 to 21. The Bengals climaxed the five-game streak in Cleveland with a 41 to 21 thrashing of the Browns. Cincinnati owned sole possession of first place in their division and had the best record in the AFC. The transformation was complete. The ugly ducklings of pro football became the swans of the sport. What we're seeing is the fruits of hard work, hard labor. Nothing was really given to us. Everything was done with our own blood and guts and with our own selves. We support each other, and now we have our fans supporting us and the media. It's really exciting. Exciting was the word for the offensive line. Bolstered by tackle Anthony Munoz, the AFC Lineman of the Year, the unit gelled in their second year together. Bush, Lapham, Bujnak, and Montoya, Wilson, Moore, and Obravich all contributed and opened running lanes for Charles Alexander, Jim Hargrove, Archie Griffin, and fullback Pete Johnson. Finesse is not a priority in the Bengals' running attack. It relies on power. And power is defined by the man that fills out the jersey of number 46. Inside this wrecking ball facade lurks a runner with all the options that Forrest Gregg admires. Pete Johnson is the type of fullback that I like. And when you give him the football, and you give him any type of daylight, he's going to make yardage. He's going to make that tough yardage for you. When Pete gets rolling, he can intimidate the opponent by just the sheer, his sheer power. I know that defensive backs, once he gets in the open, they don't like to tackle him. When you measure his size against theirs, I can, I can certainly understand that. As a runner and receiver, number 46 led all Bengals with 16 touchdowns. Pete Johnson, a plow horse among NFL thoroughbreds, met 1981 head-on and ran away with his first 1,000-yard season. Joining Johnson in the backfield is a quarterback named Anderson, the same Ken Anderson the Bengals had 11 years ago. He has weathered hard times, a succession of injuries, and a stadium frequently filled with jeers to reemerge as the NFL's top-rated quarterback. After his shaky start in week one against Seattle, Anderson rebounded to complete over 62% of his passes for 3,750 yards and 29 touchdowns. He had the lowest interception rate in the National Football League and added a number of gutty runs that made him the Bengals' second leading ball carrier. While it's true that many stars have shown in Cincinnati, without Anderson, they would not have had near the glitter. The only difference between me this year and last year, I think, is that I'm healthy. I think the second factor is I've got a lot of great people playing around me. A great offensive line and an outstanding group of receivers, headed by Isaac Curtis, number 85, the Bengals' all-time leading receiver. Curtis lent his nine years experience to number one draft pick David Verser, number 81, who averaged over 26 yards a catch. Underrated tight end Dan Ross earned national attention with a team record 71 catches. And Steve Kreider was a deep threat off the bench with 500 yards and five touchdowns. But the biggest spark in the Bengals' revived attack was second round draft choice Chris Collinsworth. Number 80 became an immediate starter with a little help from his friends. Yeah, it's been a team effort in getting me ready to play. And I've made some mistakes early and just trying to learn my assignments and, and trying to learn some of the different techniques that they were teaching up here, and it took a while to do that. 
But uh, they helped me and they stayed after me, especially Isaac. And if I can ever get to the point where I run my routes like Isaac Curtis, then, uh, then I'm going to have a future in this league. For Chris Collinsworth, the future is now. Number 80 became the top rookie receiver in football with 67 catches, over 1,000 yards, eight touchdowns, and a trip to Honolulu for the Pro Bowl. Chris Collinsworth, the one key draft pick that brought the Bengals' attack into the era of air ball. His performance was as striking and conspicuous as the Bengals' new Tiger Stripes. For the Bengal offense, the sky was the limit. For the defense, 1981 provided the chance for a group of no-names to become familiar names. They were the final pieces of a football team with few discernible weaknesses. The unit was a mixture of talented young athletes bound by the experience of men like 13-year veteran quarterback Ken Riley, number 13. It was a defense that struggled early in the year. They had the talent, but did they have the right stuff? I never felt until just recently that these people were tough enough. But, mister, they have convinced me now. They get after people, and that's what I like. The best defense is a team defense, and the Bengals were just that, an aggressive group of heavy hitters that shackled the league's most potent offenses. Ironically, this vastly improved Bengal defense did not produce one All-Pro in 1981, an indication that they had grasped the team concept. For future reference, there are names to remember. Down linemen Edwards, Whitley, Browner, St. Clair, and Burley. Linebackers LeClaire, Cameron, Williams, and Harris. Fraser, Rosano, Dinkle, and Shue. Brick by brick, the Bengals had built a wall. Safeties Bobby Kemp, Brian Hicks, Oliver Davis, and Mike Fuller. Cornerbacks Ken Riley, Ray Griffin, John Simmons, and Lewis Breeden, number 34, all helped build the spirit that built a winner. Still growing, the Bengal defense finally headed in the right direction, and it was clear that Forrest Gregg's influence had made a difference. His influence is a big part of our team. You know, he he uh, came in and gave us gave us direction and discipline when we needed it and, and turned his team around and, and as you well can, can well see uh, it's, it's worked so uh, we're pleased with him as, uh, you know he's a great head coach great man too he was able to come into a room of 60 70 men who are used to being uh, called the dregs of the NFL and tell them they could be somebody and not just somebody they could be the best you know there's a football side and a, and a personal side and I think you know the, the two are, are kind of distinct sometimes, and you can see him out in a restaurant, and he's a, he's a super guy to be around, but uh, when you, once you walk through the doors here, the practice field or the, the stadium, it's all business. That's the way it has to be. Come on, Kenny! We quit blocking anybody. We're not running. We're not doing anything. Boy, I'll tell you what. Pat kicks like somebody with a busted knuckle. Hey, you know what? You know what? You, you know what? You're always out of, out of position or something. Well, hey. He can't push off with his hand for crying out loud. What league have you been refereeing in? Can he wave his hand in front of the guy's face? Hey, don't touch him. Hey, man, you got to be kidding. Hey, you guys are reading a different rule book than me. Hey, Fred. Hey, could you ask him, explain that to me, please? I'll be very calm about this, OK? I will. OK, OK. All right, all right. Did the guy jump off sides or not? I was thinking of going lead up. He was, he, was, he was flexed off the ball, so. Oh, OK, all right. Okay. All right. You got a better view than me. <laughs> I apologize. Okay. Okay, hey. I want to I want to run the ball at him now. Stick it to him. Stick it in him.
By the season's 14th week, Forrest Gregg's discipline and direction led the Bengals to a 10 and 4 record and a chance to clinch the Central Division Championship. It has been said that to get to the Super Bowl, you must first pass through Pittsburgh. Under Forrest Gregg, the Bengals have never lost to the men of steel. Players and coaches alike go after the Steelers with an uncommon zeal. When you play Pittsburgh, you understand what's in front of you. And I think good football players, I think they respond to that challenge. Our guys, for some reason, they know that they must play their best football against Pittsburgh. Otherwise, they're going to get beat. And they're, they're not only going to get beat by the score, they're going to get beat physically. And they understand that. Yeah, come on, Kenny! Right there, right there! In a gut-level, low-scoring affair, Ken Anderson's touchdown passes to Isaac Curtis and Steve Kreider made the difference. The 17-10 win clinched Cincinnati's first division crown since 1973. Yes, there was a new and powerful force in the AFC Central, acknowledged by Steeler coach Chuck Noll. All right, Steve, listen, congratulations, hey, congratulations hey, go all the way. Hey, like one thing right now, may have worked for The it. next step for the new champions, the playoffs, and a showdown with the Buffalo Bills. The Cincinnati Bengals experienced a one-season turnaround that surprised even the most optimistic Bengal backers. As they stepped toward their first playoff game in six years, they could not help but look back at how far they'd come. The Bengals started the year hoping to escape their last play syndrome and ended the season as the strongest team in the AFC. Riverfront Stadium had a whole new look and a vast assortment of Bengal maniacs urged their team to stick it to the Buffalo Bills. <laughs> Charles Alexander's touchdown run put the Bengals up by seven. And after the Bills tied it up in the final period, Cincinnati saddled up to take the lead for good. And Anderson will go back to throw out the flat of cut. The 45 by Kreider down the sideline to the 40, down to the 35, the 30, 25, 20, and all the way down to the 17 yard line. <laughs> big, big play right here. Looking, looking, fires the field, touchdown right down the middle of Collinsworth. The Bengals won their first playoff game ever, 28 to 21. Next, a rematch with the San Diego Chargers, this time for the AFC Championship. The temperature in greater Cincinnati has dropped to nine below. With winds out of the northwest gusting at 35 miles per hour, we're talking a wind chilled 59 degrees below zero. And the Bengals are playing the San Diego Chargers for the AFC Championship today out by the river. And frankly, folks, you've got to be crazy, nuts, to be out there today. On Cincinnati's coldest day ever, the game was a survival test that called for daring and desire. The only thing that warmed the Bengals was the anticipation of victory. Throwing into a wind tunnel, Ken Anderson's passes sailed straight and true. The Chargers' passes simply sailed, and the Bengal defense frustrated San Diego as often as the wind and the chill. Let's go, Bingo! ML Harris' touchdown followed a Jim Breach field goal. The game wasn't eight minutes old, and the Bengals had a 10-point lead. Linebacker Reggie Williams forced the key turnover of the game, and it pointed the way to Pontiac. 
As the twilight deepened and the cold intensified, Anderson drilled the game-clinching touchdown to Don Bass. The Bengals had faced the elements without blinking. They were the champions of the AFC. The new look and atmosphere of a winner brought a familiar face back into focus, the face of a legend, the founder of the Cincinnati Bengals. People get disappointed when you don't do well, and uh, you just have to handle it. Uh, if you want a real lesson in that, uh, take a look at the big crowd behind me around Kenny Anderson. Uh, talk about a man that handled the things when they were very difficult for him, and I hand it to him. Proud moment. One proud moment led to another. The Bengals had reached the summit, the Super Bowl. First half mistakes allowed the San Francisco 49ers to build an apparently insurmountable lead. But the Bengals had not traveled this far to come away empty. They had learned early on to never, ever give up. The Bengals came back to dominate the second half. They had more first downs, more total yards, and scored more touchdowns than the 49ers. Ken Anderson and Dan Ross set numerous Super Bowl passing and receiving records. The Bengals never ran out of heart. They fought the good fight and fought it to the end. What they ran out of was time. There was no shame in this defeat, though they fell six points short of the peak the Bengals left footprints on the summit. They established their goal for 1982. Retrace those steps and conquer the peak.